hi guys welcome to my channel my name is Louisa if you're new here then welcome um, if you're not new here then I am going to ask quite a big favor if you've trusted me thus far then I hope that you will be able to hear me out don't worry I haven't lost my mind and I'm not here to judge anyone but I am here to let you know what I have found because I think it's important so as you have probably noticed I am leaving witchcraft I am leaving the occult the esoteric the new age whatever you want to call it this endless searching for the truth because I am pretty sure I have found it and it's taken me a long time I've gone round in a few different circles if you've seen a number of my videos um, especially recently then um, some of this will probably already make sense but um, there were things that I was not able to really share at the time so I'm gonna delve into some of that stuff so I mostly grew up in small country towns in Australia and um, I grew up in a single parent household on welfare my parents divorced when I was two my mother's family already had quite a long history with witchcraft and the occult my grandmother was born in Fiji and uh, she partly grew up there and then partly grew up in Africa and my mum was born in Kenya and that side of the family is a mixture of native Fijian, Indian, Irish and French so my ancestors would have engaged in different shamanic practices they also would have been Hindu and probably any number of other pantheistic animistic religions and my grandmother was very interested in witchcraft and the occult and she collected things like shamanic masks from Africa her family was also very psychically gifted and um, they would talk about being able to do things like telekinesis and spirit walking my parents when I was growing up um, were both quite agnostic they didn't go to church um, they didn't necessarily have a solid belief system they actually met when they were playing folk music so they used to hang out with the hippie crowd and um, play at music festivals my mum was into astrology and all of that stuff I can remember um, she used to buy like these little scrolls that looked a little bit like cigarettes and you would buy them and break them open and unfurl them and it would be an astrology reading when I was seven years old my mum was taking us to visit our grandparents in the city and we were just reaching the outskirts of town and she decided to pick up a hitchhiker this man was also going to the city so she uh, gave him a lift the entire way and they spent the car trip talking my brother and I were in the back seat doing our own thing so I don't really know what they were talking about but a week or two later he tracked us down he went back to our town and he went around the streets until he found our car now this man had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and he also was drug trafficking but from what I remember of him he had very lucid sharp eyes that were very creepy very reptilian and if I had to say what I really think I think he's the only person I've ever met who was possessed he would not leave us alone he would come to the house especially when my mother was out and my brother was uh, in charge he was about 13 at the time the man would stand outside the door and tell us to let him in and I used to have these nightmares at the time where I was hiding in a cabin in the woods and there was a werewolf outside prowling around the perimeter peering in the windows so that was when mum decided to go to church and she took us to church with her and she got us baptized but that wasn't really a deterrent for this guy he um, kept harassing 
and one week we came home from church and there was a note left outside the back door um, which said that we belonged to him and that he had written it in his own blood and the police later confirmed that it was written in blood but they couldn't necessarily say whether it was his or not so we were going to church and mum was getting the people there to pray for us um, and there were a couple of occasions where people at church had this warning given to them that um, he was going to do something and what had happened was he'd been observing our comings and goings he knew which weeks my brother and I went to visit our dad and the weekends when my mum would be home alone and on both of those occasions my mum took these people's advice she went and stayed with them for the weekend and when she came home on the Sunday the house had been broken into both times and um, he'd been through our stuff. Coming back from my dad's house and um, everything in our home covered in grey powder from the fingerprinting. So at the same time that this is going on uh, my grandfather dies and Pop was very much the glue that held the family together. He was the peacemaker because my grandmother could be extremely volatile and my grandmother and my aunt were fighting because uh, my aunt believed that my grandmother basically caused my grandfather's death by just making his life miserable. So my grandmother and my aunt had stopped talking to each other and a few days before the funeral my uncle gets up in the middle of the night and phones his sister, my aunt, and in his in their dead father's voice he tells her to make up with her mother and he actually is asleep this entire time he's not conscious and he becomes conscious when he can hear his sister crying on the phone and he's like what just happened so literally something took over his body and channeled through his vocal cords Anyway, it's the day of my grandfather's funeral and the stalker asshole crashes the funeral. My uncles both get him to clear off. Luckily, the uncle who had been channeling his dead father also happened to be a cop. But mum can't seem to get anything done about this man harassing her. Um, the police can't verify whether he broke into our house. They can't do anything about the love note written in blood. And so he's finally arrested when he tries to murder someone. And that was a, a whole separate thing. But yeah, he tried to stab someone and then they arrested him. But that guy is so far gone that in jail he commits suicide. So that was my encounter with a possessed person and there's something about their eyes which is very strange. It's clear and glassy and predatory. But as a kid and then later on also as an adult I would often see things that just weren't there. At night I would hear things whispering in my ear, I would see things out of the corner of my eye and get all sorts of strange feelings. And there was one night when we were all in the lounge room talking together and this apparition walks through the door. So I'm freaking out, but no one else can see it. And I describe this thing to my mother and I say it's a mummified woman. So we keep going to church, but the thing is, um, church has its own set of issues. I would see strange things at church and I would meet different people in the church who just gave me the willies. 
I don't know if you've ever experienced psychic attack, um, but when I was 15, I was at this um, church event. It wasn't an actual church service, but it was a church event. And there was a woman there who my mum said practiced Reiki. And during this event, I was completely overwhelmed by some kind of mental attack where I had to hold on with every ounce of strength I had to not pass out. And I could feel that it was coming from the direction of this woman, but I couldn't actually see her. She wasn't in my line of sight. So I told my mum about it the next day and she rings this woman and says to her, what did you try to do to my daughter? And the woman said, she just looked like she needed to relax. So I was trying to make her relax. Even later on when I stopped going to church because I thought if I didn't have any spiritual activity whatsoever, then I wouldn't be susceptible to this stuff. But even when I was like agnostic, not practicing anything, I lived in two different houses that were haunted to high hell and I went on a ghost tour of Port Arthur and literally saw something full frontal. So I had tried church, I had tried not church. And so when I was trying to deal with this second haunting and um, I was taking my dog to a hydrotherapy place and the woman there belonged to a group of psychics and she said that if I came along to their sessions, I might be able to learn some things and get a handle on it. So I tried that out. I did that for a while, um, quite a few months actually. And um, eventually it got to the point where they were kind of insisting that you had to have a spirit guide and that you had to channel. And with my experience with different entities, I was not at all keen to be taken over. So that was one of the many reasons why I left that group. But while I was trying to search for answers, I was also borrowing a whole bunch of books from the library and trying to research everything that I could. And I had stumbled across a book on Druidry and it seemed like an interesting proposition. They taught philosophy and uh, different things like that. So it didn't seem ultra spiritual but it seemed like maybe a way of thinking about things. So I joined that and they started sending out the material for me to learn. Um, and it was interesting, but again, they were <laughs> telling people to shamanic journey and they were also telling people to contact spirit guides. In the Druid group, there were a couple of people who belonged to a witchcraft coven and they invited me to come along to their stuff. And they gave me the material. It was interesting, but at the same time it was kind of, kind of lame as well, I have to admit. But um, one of the things that I thought was really strange was that they practiced meditation. And I was like, I don't think that really has anything to do with traditional old witchcraft. And I've never really been interested in meditation. Like it just doesn't appeal to me. I don't like the idea of turning off my brain. But even though some of their methods and philosophies seemed a little bit strange to me, um, I was still getting some benefit out of it because it seemed like it was quieting down the activity and that I could get a handle on it. And because I was kind of getting somewhere with it, I decided to share what I was learning through this channel. I actually started my blog first, and then I started the YouTube channel. Um, and when I got divorced and had to move out of my house, I decided to go to Tasmania. And when I got there, I got my first tarot deck because I didn't really know what I was going to do. I didn't really know what my plan was. I was kind of taking a lot of this stuff on faith. And that first attempt at living in Tasmania, 
Um, it was basically a carbon copy of what happened to my mother with the hitchhiker. Except that the person involved was my landlord. So I ran away back to the mainland and I lived with family for a while until I could sort out jobs and proper rentals and things like that. And around about that time was when the YouTube channel started to take off. So I thought, great, this is what I'm going to do. This is my future. I thought that I was following God because even though I had stopped going to church, I never really stopped believing. And I thought that psychic abilities were possibly a gift and that I needed to be using them. I thought that there was more than one way to get to God and it turns out I'm wrong and I need to apologize for that. So I've realized a few things and I've learned a few things and I will explain, but essentially we can't just do things our way. We have to do things the right way. To <laughs> quote the Bible in uh, Matthew chapter seven, verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. We are very easily led astray. But luckily we do have something that we can refer to, to try and figure things out. I'm going to break down how some of this stuff works. Some of you are in a similar situation where you are extremely open to different things, uh, different spirits and visions and stuff like that. And it's pretty hard to get a handle on what it is. And of course, the church always says demons. And when I was in church, that was just, you know, that was too much to deal with. Like, why would a kid be cursed with demons? I hadn't really done anything wrong. Like, I was just a kid. But I've actually learned a lot from investigating the occult. And one of the biggest things that I have learned the most about is how families pass down these things from generation to generation. And it doesn't matter what you call them, whether you call them guides or ancestors or gods or deities. The new age calls them ascended masters. Some people call them aliens and other people call them angels, but they're all false spirits. Probably the most definitive book on this subject is one called The Siren Call of Hungry Ghosts by Joe Fisher. So he got into guides and he was visiting someone who was doing channeling sessions and listening to her messages. And he thought he was connecting with a spirit guide and it turned out that he was not. And um, after publishing the book, he jumped off a cliff. And he did that because he couldn't get away from them. And I know that these things can take over your mind. They take over your emotions. They hijack your emotional state. They can implant all of these overwhelming urges to hurt yourself. When I was in my twenties and I was living in a haunted house at the time, every single night coming home from work, I would have to resist the urge to plow my car headlong into something. And um, this was before I was, you know, doing anything. This was my agnostic phase. But I was sharing the house with a Wiccan and a Hindu. And so there was all kinds of spirit activity going on. So one of the things that I've learned from my own experience from reading um, different accounts like Joe Fisher's and also other things like um, books on exorcism. I read those back when I was researching at the library. But um, working with spirits, working with guides or whatever, it's very much like hitting the agree button on your phone. So like when you install a new piece of software or when you use a new piece of technology and they give you all of their terms and conditions and you cannot use that thing 
without agreeing to it. And I don't know anyone who actually reads it. So most people have no idea what they're agreeing to. They just want to use the technology. And it is exactly the same when you work magic because it has to come from somewhere. So you hit the agree button, you let these things into your life, and then you start feeling dreadful. And you start feeling dreadful because these things are feeding off of you and because they don't like joy, they don't like peace, they don't like happiness. They can only live in disturbed, chaotic, distressed emotional states. So you'll be tired, you'll be depressed, your life will become dysfunctional, you'll be plagued with ailments. As I said before, your emotional state can be pretty volatile and you can also have obsessive, intrusive thoughts. And those thoughts can be just completely horrifying, like they have absolutely nothing to do with who you are. Or they might be terrible thoughts about other people. So you'll start feeling hollow inside and then you're usually told that the answer to that is to do more. And the more you do, the more you get rewarded with money and power and things like that. And there's sort of different levels of engagement with these things, but some of them can get pretty crazy and pretty depraved. Mm -hmm. Like, I know that my ancestors would have been cannibals. So that kind of thing curses your entire bloodline. Your entire ancestry is tainted and every subsequent generation is forced to serve a demon. Part of the process of initiating each generation is a thing called Satanic Ritual Abuse, or SRA. So I've heard of some families, like if you ever watch the Sean Atwood podcast on YouTube, there's some really disturbing stories there of SRA. And there are families that engage with this stuff um, at a really horrific level. And it kind of doesn't matter whether you believe that demons are real or not, because there are people who do, and they literally do things to serve it. So how the initiation process goes with each generation. Um, if the family is aware of it, then they do certain rituals to make sure that the children are broken. It's very similar to, again, using your phone, um, to do something like jailbreaking. If you haven't heard of jailbreaking, it's when you essentially take down the firewall software on your phone so that you can access apps which aren't in the app store. But without the protective firewall, all of this malware can come in. And SRA essentially does the same process. It breaks open the psyche, cracks open the soul in order to grant access to malware. And we have these God-given uh, protective features in our psyche so that we can try and withstand these sorts of psychological tortures. But um, at some point they do have to give. So the aim of the SRA is to force you to dissociate. If you are being tormented for long enough, either by a human being or by um, an oppressive spirit, then eventually you will try and escape. And if you can't escape physically, you will escape spiritually. And as soon as you separate from your body, it essentially opens a back door to these entities. So I believe that there are families where People are not necessarily aware of the agreement, but they're kind of compelled to perpetuate it with their own children. As I said before, some of the signs of affliction is volatile emotions, so having your emotional state hijacked and having these obsessive intrusive thoughts. So if a parent is experiencing these things and they're not able to resist it or they're not seeking the right help to resist it, then they will lash out at their children and they will alleviate their own suffering by doing what the demon wants them to do. And I think my mother was very much like that because she 
could not resist the urge to abuse us. And I know that she had that from her own mother. So one of the things that happened to me when I was a kid, which makes me think that, you know, it's, it's really dangerous to dissociate. Um, I was ironing some clothes and I just zoned out. I, I didn't pass out, but I just went blank. And in this weird zoned out state, I reached over and I touched the front of the iron and I snapped out of it after I burnt myself. And that was really scary because it reinforced the notion that I was not in complete control of my own body at all times. And then later on when I was in my late teens, I had um, a couple of instances where I involuntarily astral traveled. Like I would be trying to go to sleep and instead of going to sleep, I would get ripped out of my own body and like whoosh up to the ceiling and hit the ceiling. And it's a really freaky feeling. It um, makes your heart race. And I would force myself back into my body and then wake up. And I would often have to get out of bed and go and do something else and be lucid for a while so that it would go away. And like, I never enjoyed <laughs> any of these experiences, but I know that there are people in my family who do enjoy these experiences and who keep, like deliberately do them. And that's the thing about a demonic attachment is it goes both ways. People get attached to the demon because they enjoy the power trip. All right. So there were a number of things that I was investigating um, throughout the last year. And if you've been following the channel, then you probably would have seen some of that stuff. But a lot of what I was researching and investigating actually kept coming back to different parts of the Bible that I could remember from when I was a kid and I used to go to Bible study. But there were a number of different nudges some subtle, some not so subtle. The first sign that I was on the wrong track was when my values did not align with that of the pagan community. Because I don't believe that I'm a god, which is kind of what the New Age teaches. I am monotheistic and um, <laughs> I don't know if a, a human being can ever really reach enlightenment. I don't believe in forcing my will onto other people, which is often what you encounter when people are practicing magic. I won't cheat, steal, lie, wish ill on others, or advocate for killing people. So I discovered that compared to a lot of people, I'm actually quite moralistic and that my values are quite conservative. And in the pagan and new age, community, that's a dirty word. They will be accepting and loving of everyone except anyone that has standards. Because the whole thing is all about moral relativism and it just doesn't work. So yeah, I am going to say that anyone who thinks that enlightenment can be found up their own butthole is probably full of shit. People accuse Christianity of lacking reason without really noticing the absurdity of their own ideologies. And the thing is, like, Christianity is all about reason, all about logic, all about discernment. And the first chapter of Proverbs talks about this quite thoroughly in the personification of wisdom. Wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the open squares. She cries out in the chief concourses. At the openings of the gates in the city, she speaks her words. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn at my rebuke. Surely I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you, because I have called and you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded. Because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke. Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies. For the turning away of the simple will slay them, 
and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. So as my research into the mindset of the nihilistic atheist and the willfully blind new ager continued, I discovered a few things. First of all, people don't want to see uncomfortable truths. Secondly, they would rather live a lie than have to rethink all of their ideas. And thirdly, we're all easily manipulated by our weaknesses. No one wants to think that the devil is real. I know I didn't, and I did everything in my power to circumvent that. But there are people who believe that it is real and who use it. Take the Fabian Society, for example. Their literal coat of arms is a wolf in sheep's clothing, which is directly referencing the Bible. Like, they know what's in the Bible and they deliberately subvert it. Why? Because they know it's real. So the passage about the wolves in sheep's clothing is in Matthew chapter 7. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. And the thing about the Fabian Society is they are powerful people in powerful positions. If you have a look at this photo of former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair unveiling a stained glass window of the Fabian Society at the London School of Economics. These people literally run the highest institutions. They run politics, they run the media, and they run education. Another strange coincidence, and what I think was possibly um, nudges from God, was that I did a video, and some of you would have seen it, where I talked about how there are wolves in sheep's clothing and they keep saying to the flock, don't trust the sheepdogs, even though the sheepdogs are the ones that are actually looking after the flock. And I used that analogy in my video before I even knew that the Fabian Society existed. And then a little while ago, my research led me across the path of St. Thomas Aquinas, who was a Dominican and the word Dominican actually means the hounds of God, and they're also referred to as the sheepdogs. If you've never heard of Thomas Aquinas before, I highly recommend looking into his philosophy. He wrote a whole series of philosophical works called The Five Ways to Prove God, and he used a lot of Aristotle's philosophy as a reference point. So I don't think that those things were a coincidence. I do think that they are part of a larger truth. And I also think that God does guide us when we are completely lost. And I was totally lost. My life has pretty much been a series of unfortunate events. And even though I was getting to the point where I could see the light at the end of the tunnel, I still was not out of the woods. So I am coming to the realization that I need to go back to church and I start talking to my partner about it. Now, my partner grew up in a very um, agnostic kind of household. He had hippie parents and um, at one point in his teenage years, his mum actually worked at a Buddhist retreat center and that's where he lived for a while. So he had never been to church and he had no idea what was in the Bible. But what he did know was that when he started meditating as a teenager was also roughly the time when he started having sleep paralysis. So a lot of people don't realize that meditation is actually very similar to astral travel and shamanic journeying. And our brain states when we are falling asleep and when we are just waking up are the same brain states that people go into when they meditate. And it's a very open, suggestible, kind of brain state, which is why a lot of people's experience of the supernatural tends to happen when they're falling asleep. So I introduced my partner to the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas, and he's quite interested. So we decided to go and buy Bibles because neither of us owns a Bible. Well, that day was a complete schmozzle. We went to two different stores. One of them did not exist anymore. Its website was still there, but the store itself had closed down. And the second one we got there, 
just after it had closed. And we even tried going to another town and visiting a bookstore there and its opening hours were not available online so again we got there just after it had closed. So we're unable to buy a bible <laughs> and we start making plans to go to church. But the night before we're due to go to church we get no sleep. So the next morning is a write-off, we can't go and all of these different experiences start happening over the week. So like technology fails, um, we're disturbed at like three o'clock in the morning in our separate houses, dwelling places. You know how people say in domestic violence situations that the most dangerous time is when you're trying to leave? Yeah, this is the same thing. But anyway, we make solid plans to go and buy our Bibles and we make it this time. Although during the road trip, I actually started getting lightheaded and almost dissociating. So we've got our Bibles and now we can start planning to go to church and it gets to Saturday morning and I wake up with a migraine. I take four painkillers straight away. I take two paracetamol and two ibuprofen and the migraine will not go. So every four hours I am taking four tablets throughout the entire day and nothing will touch this headache. But we go out anyway during the day. We're having a look around at the different churches trying to figure out which one we want to go to and what times they're actually open because a lot of these places do not advertise anything online. But we find this one church that actually has a Saturday night session and we decide that we need to do it that night because if we risk doing it on the Sunday morning, we might not make it. So I am in pain. I am having trouble staying in my own body, but we make it into the church. And as we go through the church service, the pain starts to leave. I start to feel more lucid. My mind clears up and I just feel at peace. So by the time we leave the church, my headache is gone. I feel completely normal. I have my energy back and I can actually cook dinner. And that's the thing about God. That's why people find it so challenging is because he doesn't necessarily just clear the path for you. You have to really make an effort. But as long as you do have that foundation of faith in your life, then it does make things a lot easier to get through. Again, in Matthew chapter seven, it goes on to say, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain descended, the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. When you're trying to find meaning in life and you don't have that reference point of God and Jesus, it is literally like trying to build your life on sand. It can easily be eroded underneath you as soon as difficulty in life rears its ugly head. And I've talked about that before where the new age movement is all about love and light and positive vibes and positive thinking. And life just isn't like that. So we keep going into these downward spirals of despair. We're constantly being told that the truth is subjective, that there is no objective, rational truth. And this undermines our ability to have a firm footing on anything. People don't like the Bible because it holds them to account and it makes them uncomfortable. Jesus wasn't crucified because he was spreading a message of love and peace. Jesus was crucified because he called people out on their shit. And that's why there's always been a concerted effort to erode his teachings. But the truth is that you can't serve two masters. There comes a day when you have to choose. And Jesus continues to be the one that keeps shining a light 
into dark corners. In John 8 verse 31, Jesus says to those who believe him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And the Bible has always helped me to make sense of the world. Whenever some really strange stuff is going on, I usually can actually reference it to something that's in the Bible. If you actually study it, it has this great ability to untangle really convoluted thinking. And when you're dealing with really slippery people who are employing smoke and mirrors, you kind of need it. Again, in John chapter eight, it says, why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore you do not hear because you are not of God. And that's definitely what I have come across in the past with different videos. It's like, I do all this research, I put all this stuff together and I present it to people in a very logical, straightforward manner. And I'm not telling them that they need to believe it, but I am telling them that they need to at least consider it. But I will get people saying, oh, I don't want to look at anything from that guy. That guy doesn't know what he's talking about. It's like, why are you so threatened by another person's opinion? Is it because it actually shows up the fallacies of yours? If your ideas and your arguments can't stand up to scrutiny, it's because they're not built on anything real. And that's what I found with the new age and with paganism and with all of those other religious practices. They're not built on anything real. And so they don't hold up under pressure. And at the moment in the world, there is a lot of pressure. So you have to have something real and solid at your back. If you haven't read the Bible before, I highly recommend it. If you need more reasoning behind faith, then look into Thomas Aquinas. If you're interested in sticking around, I will continue to do videos on psychology and also on uncovering different things. A lot of it will probably have a very Christian slant on it. But as long as you're cool with that, then you're welcome. Okay guys, take care out there and I'll see you next time. Bye.